Okay, we don't need to wait for that full countdown. Let's just switch it over. Good morning. I believe this is working, I think. Okay, so uh, I hope someone's watching, or I hope this is working. It's hard to tell, I've had a little uh, some issues here, and I'm, that's why I'm a little bit late getting started today. Uh, I'm even noticing my, my lag is pretty bad in terms of the audio um, video synchronizing, so that's kind of weird. Um, I also Discord wasn't connecting, so I couldn't actually um, send the notice that I was getting ready to go live. Um, hopefully, some of you are out there. Hopefully, you know that this is, you know, the, the Monday morning tradition that we've been doing for several weeks now. So hopefully, you know, you just have it kind of automatic to tune in on Mondays. But I'm, you know, it's not seeing any viewers yet. But if you are watching, um, please say hi if you can in Discord. If not, the Twitch chat might work. Um, but okay, no, I just see I see 16 viewers now. Yeah, my my audio lag is. How does it, well? Okay, so to me it looks pretty bad. But tell me, um, hey, thanks to Yoshi Player. Um, uh, but it looks like my video and audio seem out of sync to me. Um, but if it look, but I have a I've set an offset, so hopefully it synchronizes it by the time it gets to you. So let me know if that looks okay. And Yoshi Player is telling me it looks okay. So hopefully that's all right. And if you, if you look above me, you'll see. The chat thing is still, um, oh, okay, maybe. <laughs> uh, the chat thing is still loading. I think Discord might be having issues this morning because when I tried to send my message saying, hey, I'm getting ready to stream, I sent it uh, a couple times before it actually went through. So I don't, I don't know what's up with that. Um, so, okay, great. So it looks like all, everyone else is having issues with Discord. So, okay, cool. Well, that's why we, you know, good thing we have the Twitch chat. So um, please use that, I guess, if you have any questions while I'm talking. Um, I don't know if it's going to be that, I mean, I don't know what you'll have to say, uh, but hopefully uh, Discord does come back. Um, let's see. I decided to reboot my computer. Man, my computer's running at 40%. That's something that's like running on my computer. It's taking up a lot of CPU. I did, uh, I mean, I installed the folding at home thing, but it should be paused right now. Um, okay. So you are typing in Discord right now? Let me see. I have, to, I have Discord closed, so. Um, oh, yeah, okay. Now I see you. Cool. Yeah, and, and actually, if you have um, issues in both Twitch and Discord, they could be on the same kind of back end server. Usually when there's kind of service um, hiccups on the internet it's usually one of the big like backbone cdns like aws or you know i don't even know which other ones there are uh, digital ocean those kind of things uh, it's usually something like one of those is having an issue and then everyone that depends on those um, has issues so i don't know so let's take a look uh today here's this is the agenda for today i'm going to be talking about my favorite thing is monsters and this is a the next book that we're going to read and um, I was actually, so I was gone all weekend. I got back last night, so I have not had a chance to give you like the page number or the page cover page breakdown that I intend to, uh, but I will get that later today. I just, uh, ha I was focusing on putting some slides and notes together to introduce this book to you. So I'm gonna do that first. And as I talk about it, I'll give you some, a sense of kind of how to work your way through it, hopefully. Uh, let's take a look at the schedule so we can sort of see how everything is doing there. And I do have, I'll try to keep and I am both Discord and the Twitch chat. It's kind of hard for me to see both at the same time, um, unless I do a couple things. But uh, you know, I I will get to you eventually uh, if you have a question there. So we are wrapping up the web comic um, now. That today is supposed to be the last day, but if you're still finishing, that's all right. Uh, just make sure you get it done as soon as you can. Uh, next week, next Monday, will be presentations. And I, you know, I've been thinking about this. I don't know of other ways to do this other than uh, well, let's take a look at it. Um, the way it's described in here. So, I mean, usually this is a, uh, this is how it normally goes. So this is the, it's the Patechka style of presentation where each person presents for a, it's a group presentation. Each of you has a slide for 40 seconds at a time. You set it up to run on a timer and then you 
kind of have a, a script usually and then or notes at least and you you read it you you take turns basically reading it um, each presentation lasts exactly six minutes and 40 seconds if you follow the instructions and um, I mean yeah you just kind of work your way through it now I, I had intended to write another version of this and I, maybe I added that in canvas but I'm not gonna pull up canvas now because it takes too long um, so all this is to say these are the things you need to be thinking about in terms of this presentation and what I would recommend is uh, go ahead and start working on your Google Doc and then uh, like a Google I like working in Google Slides because you can share it and all of you can edit it at the same time. So that's that makes sense to me. If you have some other way of doing it, that's fine. I'm just I suggest you start with a Google Slides uh, document thing, and then uh, start building it out so that you address all of these things. So the theme and the plot, the creative working process, division of labor, how you approach to publicizing, how you approach publicizing it, and that might include also like analytics if you got like a, a sense of who was reading your comic and then uh, design choices that you used in actually publishing it and putting it online. So that would be mainly Instagram versus Mary Washa Comics. Why did you choose one versus the other? What did you get from both of these? Um, so I so here's what I, yeah, here's the suggestion. They should be pre-recorded, but it may be easier for each group member to individually record their 40 second segments and then combine them into a single video. I don't actually know if that's easier. I, <laughs> I thought of it that way when I wrote it, but um, that means someone's gonna have to edit it all together and that could be a pain. I might it might work better if you all get on a zoom call and then um, Record that and like so run the presentation Speak the parts that you're responsible for on the zoom and then that recording is what you share on uh, next Monday so that other everyone else can see it um, so if you would like to do that, it is possible, by the way, sometimes um, it's helpful to have your slides automatically advanced. Um, it is possible to do that in Google Slides, and in fact, I can show you here how to do that. Um, I, to follow my constraints, it needs to be advancing every 40 seconds, but uh, if you'll notice, Google Slides does not have this option. There is, however, a workaround. So let me show you the workaround, actually. This is obviously my presentation for today. Uh, but whenever you do this, it, when you, whenever you choose an auto advance uh, option there, uh, if you copy the URL and take a look at it in a new browser, this last bit here that says delay MS equals 30,000, that's the number of milliseconds to delay. And since that's a, uh, just a URL parameter, you can actually change that arbitrarily. So you can say instead of 30,000, let's do 40,000, not 4,000, 40, wait, why is it inserting instead of, oh no, I'm just adding zeros. Um, that's gonna, so it's, yeah, so 40,000 would be 40 seconds. So these are milliseconds, so that's a thousand per second. If you wanted it to go once a second, you would make that 1,000. Anyway, the point is that you can do this auto advancing thing in Google Slides just fine, and often that's easier because you've shared it and worked on it in Google Slides, and then you're just publicizing it, publishing it with this URL in Google Slides, and then you can run it in your Zoom if you would like to do it that way. Um, let me think a little bit more about some process recommendations, uh, but if you have other ideas about how to present, basically, um, let me know. It could be something that uh, someone else may have a good idea for. So that's the idea, but hopefully the idea of what to put in it makes sense and you can start working on it that way. If you have any questions about that, uh, let me know. You go ahead and put that in Discord or Twitch, whichever one is working, which <laughs> if either one is working for you. and. Um, I mean, hopefully you're able to see me talking right now, but uh, whichever chat is working, uh, or you just send me an email. Uh, and of course, I'll talk about it some more in person on uh, Wednesday. So, okay, cool. Um, let me take a sip here. So the book in question today is My Favorite Thing is Monsters. We're gonna spend two weeks on this book because it's a bit longer and uh, it's about 400 pages. And these are intensely detailed pages, some of them. Others are less, but it's a, it's a very rich book. It's a book that we can spend a lot of time uh, just looking at. It's a, it's a beautiful book aesthetically. So I'm gonna be talking about it today and giving you a sense of how to read it and some of the major ideas in it. This is a very simple, straightforward introduction. Nothing super complicated or scholarly here at this point, although I will have some things I've got to share, I think, later on. By the way, I don't know if you've noticed, but I, I, I have a brick wall behind me. <laughs> It doesn't matter, right? I mean, this is the wall that's always been back there. I just usually have my green screen thing, but as you can see, my green screen sort of fell down. Well, you can, kind of, if I go this way, you can see that that's what's where it is right now. It fell down and I haven't bothered to put it back up. Um, just as the changing humidity and temperature in here has, you know, started it's getting colder, but then I ran a space heater and I think that sort of melted the glue on the tape or something and it, um, it fell, so 
I don't know. I don't feel that strongly about putting it back up anyway. Uh, but here we go. So <laughs> that's what's happening. My favorite thing is Monsters. It's a book by uh, an artist uh, writer named Emil Ferris. And so usually when I introduce new books to you all, I give you a sense of the artist and writer and whoever else might be involved in the book and some of their other work. Uh, Emil Ferris is the sole creator of this book. Uh, she's the she writes the text. She illustrates each page. Um, and also, this is her only major work, or really her only published work. I, I think there is, uh, there, I mean, there is a, a small like addendum to uh, my favorite thing is Monsters Book One. Um, there is hopefully a book two coming out, um, but this is this is it for her. And so this is an interesting uh, situation for for an artist. Uh, this was her kind of breakthrough work. She had a career as an artist and illustrator and designer, um, but as far as comics, this is this is her comic work. And um, so, yeah, that's it. So this is her, and so there we'll learn a little bit about her. And there are a few interviews you can find on YouTube, uh, a few things where she tells us a little bit about her, her life, uh, and some of that is, um, well, it's written here, I guess. Uh, this book was published in 2017, and this book, um, the as I mentioned, volume two or book two has been forthcoming uh, for since then, pretty much. Uh, it would like in it would if you looked on Amazon, you can still look on Amazon. And it says, currently it says September 2021 as when book two is coming out. Um, but like last September, it said September 2020. And the one before that, it said September 2019. So it keeps getting pushed back. Uh, I'm not sure why, but except that I can imagine this is an enormously difficult book to follow up. And also um, just the, the style that she illustrates in it, I imagine must be incredibly time consuming. So that's, I certainly understand if it's taking her some time. Uh, but okay, so here's a little bit more about her actually here. Um, she, so this was her first published book, as I said, uh, when Emil Ferris was creating this and just kind of becoming an artist in the early 2000s. She had an experience with West, West Nile virus, of all things, and suffered from paralysis related to that. And uh, had to essentially recover that and like relearn how to draw after recovering from uh, West Nile. I think she still has complications from that. So she's someone who had to really kind of struggle physically to get to the point where she could illustrate this, and and yet she has. Uh, which I think is another testament to her skill as an artist, and as we'll see, her um, just draftsmanship, like her ability to create images. And this image on the right uh, is the cover of the book, obviously, and in this book, this, this cover image, I think you can really see um, the complexity of her art, the texture of it, and the many layers. This is all done in literally ballpoint ink. Uh, this is not like a digital trick. She physically draws in different colored ballpoint pens on notebook paper <laughs> to create these images. So it's uh, really impressive and interesting. Um, this book has won multiple awards and has been widely acclaimed and studied and talked about. And I think you'll see why as you read it. It's a book that, as we'll see, deals with some painful topics, um, but in such an honest and in intimate and rich way that I think it's just an amazing work of art. Uh, and, and you'll see what I mean, hopefully. I, I've come to really like this book. Uh, so, um, as I mentioned, her style, it's, it's a bull the ballpoint pen, and there is a kind of, um, I guess, suppleness to the art and a almost voluptuous quality to some of her illustration. And also, because she's working in these, these ballpoints, essentially, it gives her the ability to add lots of interesting little details sometimes. And this is an example on the cover. If you look closely, you can see uh, this character, the blue woman here is Anka, and if we look closely, we can see Karen reflected in Anka's eyeball um, looking back at us. And it's an interesting little almost Easter egg built into that cover image. Um, it says a lot. Um, we see this sort of full moon back there. We see this kind of spooky uh, sky in the background. We see this woman with a, uh, a really uh, complex facial expression. It's kind of hard to, to interpret. Um, there's maybe fear, there's worry, there's sadness, um, there's so much going on there. And yet what, what she's looking at, or seeing anyway, is Karen, who we are occupying Karen's position in the sense that Karen reflected back at us is coming from us, if that makes sense. So uh, there's, a, there's an interesting little uh, interplay of looking and being looked at just in that cover image. And that's the kind of thing that you kind of look for as you read this book. Um, her art, the art style does shift uh, throughout the book through different in different ways. Uh, some characters are always drawn in really rich detail. Some are always drawn kind of sketchy. Uh, I think that's intentional, and I think it does help 
control the pacing of the story and also the, the sense that we get from different characters. So we'll talk about that as we get into it. Um, okay, so the setting here, this is 1960s Chicago, late 1960s Chicago. Um, this is from the opening chapter, so you, you probably already read this area here. Um, but this is where she's um, transforming and into a werewolf. Karen is transforming into a werewolf. And so we see the images, um, and these are, uh, it's a good sort of blend of city, uh, cityscape. We see the, the skyscrapers of Chicago there. We see downtown um, stuff, you know, places you might walk, and then just random people. Um, so that's that's where we're set. Uh, the 1960s is a setting that we've spent a fair amount of time in actually this semester. I didn't really plan it that way, but it I guess it kind of makes sense and it might be interesting to look at different points of view here. Um, so because we've got this, we've got Stuck Rubber Baby also in the 1960s, and of course March in the 1960s. Um, so really all kind of coming together. I'm trying to think if there's any more <laughs> that were in the 1960s, but I mean, I guess Watchmen had some period, you know, some stuff in the 1960s, but uh, and it was really about the 70s. But anyway, these are, um, it's a different book. H1 has its own uh, contribution to make to our understanding of uh, this time period. Um, okay, so as the book is structured, the, uh, as, as I've said, there are no page numbers. There are, however, chapters. And uh, these are, and they're, and they're like 16 pages each, I think. Um, these are covers of comic books. Um, these are not real comic books. These are um, inventions. These are, or in some cases, parodies of, of well-known ones. Uh, but these are images that Emil Ferris uses to organize the book. And it, this is what I'm going to be giving you as references to places to read to. Um, so these are some of them. And often the imagery or the title of each of these is thematically related to the contents of that chapter. So um, uh, not always in direct ways, but in ways that are um, sometimes subtle, or, but at least that they, or, or metaphorical, uh, like for example, Kiss of the Warlock kind of raises the question of which character is the warlock or how to, what is a warlock in this context. Um, also, as you see these images, you can get a sense of the overall tone for the book. Um, monsters and monstrousness is of course a theme or a motif rather even, uh, but I'll guess both, right? So you do see quite a few monsters in this book. And in fact, each of the major characters has a particular kind of monster associated with them. Um, Karen, who is the main character, is a werewolf. And for example, um, and also as you see these here, right? I mean, there's other just general monsterness. Um, Karen tells us that she is obsessed with monsters. She thinks they're great. Um, she is mainly thinking of comic books like this and uh, monster movies from the 1950s and 60s, um, which are like the classic um, hammer horror movies. And yeah, I mean, they're, they're kind of cheesy, I think. these The movies, like the monsters that she's talking about, the kinds of things that I don't find particularly, I don't know about you, but I don't think they're particularly scary. I think they're just kind of um, nostalgic or, or, you know, old fashioned. I think the, the monsterness here is, uh, is other things, like the horrible parts of this book are not the monsters. And I think that's part of what you'll find as you read. I think that's pretty, pretty easy to pick up on. Uh, as you read it. I think also, by the way, this picture down here, I think she must, uh, Emil Ferris must have used herself as a character reference for this one, this ghastly on the bottom left there, because um, she does kind of look like that. I mean, not not scary, but um, let's see, where did she go? Yeah, just the hairstyle and the face shape, it just looks similar to her. Um, she has said she uses, she used her daughter as the, the, model, the reference for Anka, um, which is interesting. So there's, yeah, so this is the, the book cover. Um, they all, these all have names like Ghastly and Dread and Creatures. Um, this is meant to be like the Tales from the Crypt kind of comic books uh, or, or creepy. Um, I've been reading like um, a big archive of creepy comics. They, like these are just, just as like casual, like going to bed kind of reading. Um, creepy comics are pretty entertaining, kind of like little miniature Twilight Zone uh, stories and almost always really cheesy and, and silly, but that's kind of kind of the fun of it. Um, very rarely are they kind of scary, but not even that much. Uh, anyway, so these are the monsters, and monstrousness is a really powerful theme, and so uh, pay attention to how monsters are formed, where they come from, how they're explained, what their roles are within this book. And uh, Karen's relationship to monsters is something that she will continually reflect on, so I think you'll, you'll see it uh, as well. Okay, so some characters. 
This is the Reyes family. This is Karen, and this is Mrs. Reyes. I can't remember her name. She's always referred to as mom uh, most of the time. I, I, I'm, I'm sure her name is referenced in there somewhere. I just couldn't find it as I was uh, putting this slideshow together, But because she's almost always just referred to as mom uh, or as her mother. So she's uh, on the top right there. Karen is in the middle. Karen is the main character, the narrator, um, the purported author of the book, uh, right? So this is her, um, her point of view on things that we're experiencing. And that's important to keep in mind. Uh, Karen is, a, is the narrator and in many cases explains things to us as she understands them. Uh, and because she's a child, because she has her own ideas about things, she might explain things or might see things in ways that are different than the way you or I might see them. So in, in some cases, we might view Karen as an unreliable narrator. Uh, we might need to read between the lines a little bit of what she's reporting to us uh, from her point of view. Uh, I mean, just as a really simple one, she always draws herself as a werewolf. She always has fangs and um, like furry hands and stuff. So she's uh, uh, she fully occupies that identity. Um, other characters comment on that sometimes, but also sometimes try to encourage her to confront her real girlness, like her being a girl. And so this uh, this is an example of how we need to think of her point of view as we are reading this book. Um, yeah, I don't want to get too head, far ahead into it, but obviously, but the ideas of transformation, I think especially in that opening chapter, you can really see that there's some, you know, you, there's some themes around transformation and puberty and, and coming of age, and certainly that's a part of the monsterness here. The idea of becoming something else is a, a way of thinking about growing up, and that's certainly something that Karen is, uh, is going through in this book. Um, okay, so moving on, a few other characters. These are uh, some other characters that are related in a, a network, I guess. Anka is her upstairs neighbor. Sam is her husband. Herr Schutz is a character who we'll learn a little bit about later on, but is very important in Anka's story. So Anka, and this is not a huge spoiler because it happens in the first few pages, Anka has died and Karen is investigating her death. So that's, that is the kind of ongoing... Um, the thing that motivates the plot, the thing that kind of drives the plot forward, is trying to figure out what happens to Anka, uh, what happened to Anka. Uh, at one point, Karen discovers some tapes and other documents about Anka, and um, so that chunk of the book, maybe a third of the book, is uh, essentially a frame story. It's Anka's story, but Karen telling us Anka's story. Uh, and that's where her shoots comes, uh, comes in. Uh, and you can kind of see, like, characters have uh, a, a monster associated with them. Um, I, I'll go back to this slide for a minute. Ray's family, like, Karen's a werewolf. Uh, uh, her mother is a witch. Uh, her, her brother, who is the, in the bottom right here, I forgot to mention him, that's uh, Dee's or Diego. Uh, he is uh, a either a vampire or perhaps an incubus kind of character. Um, he is a loving and protecting and fiercely loyal brother um, and yet also has other qualities about him that aren't as pleasant and so these are things that Karen associates with a, a vampire and so you'll see him drawn that way uh, several times and also just you know acting like a vampire uh, so this is the and then you look at Anka, Anka and uh, Sam are kind of mummies I guess uh, especially with Sam he frequently is drawn with the, the vertical lines going down his face um, Anka is sort of like an idol character. I don't know. She's like a, a goddess almost the way that she's drawn. Um, but she's always blue or almost always blue. And that helps us kind of pick her out in the crowd sometimes. Uh, and also just, you know, that, that is an example of Karen's stylized drawing to give us uh, her impression of what she looks like. A few other characters. These are some of Karen's friends from school, Missy, Sandy, and Frank. And these characters all kind of come in and out of um, Karen's life in different ways. Um, I don't know if Missy has a monster association that I, I can't really think of one if she does. Maybe a vampire. <laughs> um, uh, Sandy is a, a ghost kind of character or a skeleton and Frank is a Frankenstein's monster kind of character. Um, so those are, um, yeah, they, they show up and they have, they help her out a little bit in her quest, I guess, uh, or they have their own issues going on. Um, and yeah. Those are them. Okay. Uh, thematically speaking, and in terms of setting, I think that the Art Institute of Chicago is worth mentioning. This book is set in Chicago, and the Art Institute is 
uh, present in this book almost to the extent that it merits inclusion as another character. And so that's why I wanted to mention it. Um, you'll see these figures of the lions on the sidewalk up front. This was the closest I, see, I could get to that point of view. The one on the right here is the closest I could get to that point of view from um, Google Street View. But the lions there are very iconic. Like they're very clearly associated with the front steps of this building. And you can see it clearly. Uh, the, the drawing on the left was drawn from standing over here on the sidewalk. So um, it, it's a very much drawn from real life. You can see the small lion in the background, this one up close, this sort of planter thingy, um, I guess flower pot thing. Uh, even the flags are the same as you look across here, uh, the top there, it's just a slightly different angle. Uh, the lion is looking, I feel like the comic book's lion is kind of looking up a little bit more than the real one. Maybe that's significant, uh, maybe not. Uh, I do think, uh, as you'll see with several other images that are drawn from real life, I think sometimes, this is kind of my hunch actually, I don't, I don't even have much evidence for this, but I feel like sometimes uh, when Emil Ferris gives us a, a, version of a, an, a, a version of an image that we can find in real life, sometimes she changes it in subtle ways that might be clues. And I say clues because this is a book with several mysteries, Karen is always looking for clues thinks of herself as a detective. So I think Emil Ferris wants us to do that as well and has left us some clues to try to piece together some, some of the unanswered questions. And I think sometimes a slight it, mismatch between a real life image and a illustrated image might be significant or, or might not be, but that's just, it's something I've noticed and I'm, I'm wondering about. And I'm hoping that book two will come out and either confirm or deny some of my theories, but we'll see. <laughs> so this is uh, the Google Street View. I always like looking at Google Street View because it helps you get a sense of a place and um, you know that's a, a way that many of us are getting senses of places these days. Uh, so it's just kind of nice too to be able to imagine Emil Ferris like literally standing about where this fire hydrant is or maybe over here, maybe she set up an easel and, and sketched for a while, maybe she took a picture and then looked at it later. And uh, But like the idea that she was in this place gives us a sense of this place. And if you've never been to Chicago, it's helpful to kind of look around and see what it's like to, to walk around Chicago. Um, you've got these big buildings, but it's unlike other big cities with skyscrapers, I feel like Chicago is pretty walkable um, in my experience of being there a couple of times. Uh, New York, unlike New York, which I find is very um, crammed in and, and crowded and tense. Uh, I think Chicago feels a little bit more relaxed. It could have to also be a function of having been to both of those cities in different times of the year. Um, but it's a, Chicago is, um, yeah, it's a very, obviously an urban city um, and lots of interesting things going on there. And this is, this is where this, is, this story takes place. Uh, there are a couple other locations that are named and so we can look at those later if we want. Uh, there's a cemetery, for example, uh, later on in the book that, uh, they spend some time in. So yeah, Art Institute of Chicago. The Art Institute is, is important not just because of uh, that um, location, but because several of the works in, that are collected at the Art Institute of Chicago uh, appear in this book. And this is one of the most important ones, this Temptation of the Magdalene by Jacob Jordan. Jordans? Jordans? I don't know how you pronounce his name, unfortunately. Uh, but this is a, a painting that, uh, reoccurs different fragments in this painting and I think the whole thing at one point appear throughout this book and so this is a one of the cases where we can look at how Emil Ferris has illustrated it and then compare that with the actual painting and in some cases might see something different or might be interested in at least we might we can be interested in the things that she has chosen to emphasize over others. Um, she is, of course, drawing in ballpoint pen, so she has a different color range available, and so she's, in some cases, um, I guess, translating the, the existing color palette into her co color palette. For, that's just one example. Other things are like, she'll, she'll pull out details in the painting that I probably would not have noticed, at least not from looking at the image in this scale. But some of these paintings that she's referring to are actually very large, and so uh, I don't know if you've had the experience of going to a museum when you stand in front of a large work of art, it's so much more compelling, I think. It's so much more interesting. You can see much, so much more detail and think about the craftsmanship of it in such a more meaningful way. Uh, and I think part of what Emil Ferris gives us is that appreciation or that kind of appreciation for these artworks. 
And sometimes that kind of appreciation takes you somewhere kind of mysterious, and that's what she's alluding to here in this uh, this page. So this is a this is the Temptation of the Magdalene by Jacob Jordan's Jordan's, um, and the Art Institute of Chicago actually includes quite a lot of their collection online. So you can look at it in in a fair amount of detail, and uh, even zoom in on it. All right. So this image uh, of the skull is an interesting starting point uh, for this to, to kind of work our way through this painting. Um, if you look at it kind of line for line, and this is it in, in I guess I can't really zoom into this image, can I? Maybe I can. Yeah, that works. Um, oh yeah, that worked quite well actually. So this is, this is the uh, image from My Favorite Thing is Monsters. And if you look at the shape of the skull, it, it's I think obviously a pretty close match. Um, the shadows are there, it, it, but it's a really unusual skull. And I think I almost wouldn't have noticed that in this painting. This is an unusual painting. The more you look at it, the weirder it gets. And um, that's that's part of what Karen, Karen is experiencing. Um, but one of those weirdnesses, like our, our eye is kind of drawn essentially to, first to the Magdalene here, uh, this figure, and this is called the temptation of the Magdalene. So what is she being tempted by is kind of a question, I guess. Um, but this skull on her lap is really unusual. Um, the idea, like this is a, a the, the subject of the Magdalene is a recurring subject in art. Like it's a, a thing that many people painted um, and the they almost always include a skull. And as far as I know, that's not, no one's sure why or where that pattern or that idea came from, except maybe to symbolize mortality. Um, but her idea of being tempted and having a skull with her at the time is is a thing. Like that's a thing, the skull isn't isn't random, except that the origin of that motif is kind of mysterious. Um, but the shape and position of this particular skull is a little bit unusual. Um, it does appear to be uh, de deformed in some way. It may not even be a human skull. It's unusually wide. Um, the open part appears to be more of a cavity. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's an unusual shape. So the Magdalene, yeah, Magdalene is a, it's Mary Magdalene from the Bible. Uh, Christine is asking on, on, the, on Twitch, what is the Magdalene? So um, actually, this is a good question. Let's take a look. Um, we'll just go to Google, right? Um, so temptation uh, of the Magdalene, Magdalene. Um, so this is, let's just go, go here. Oh, wow, okay. So there's some, there was a movie, I guess, it looks like. Um, so uh, let's see, this is actually a bit about this one. Um, I don't want to see the movie. <laughs> this is a bit about this particular painting, um, but the, let's see, well, we'll just learn about her in, we'll just learn about her. Oh, right, The Last Temptation of Christ, that's the movie, right, that's the, well, that's the movie that plays out the um, theory that Mary Magdalene and Jesus were lovers, I think. Uh, if I remember correctly, or that, that he was tempted by her. Um, but she was a, a woman who, yeah, I mean, she was uh, converted. So she was someone who was meant to be, like she traveled with the apostles, right? She was there at the crucifixion. Um, she was yes, one of the first to witness Jesus' in an empty tomb after the resurrection. Um, and here's a painting. This is the penitent Magdalene, and you can see the skull motif. Like for some reason, she often has a skull here. And um, no one's sure why, but that's, yeah, that's Magdalene, Mary Magdalene. And so when you say the Magdalene, that's the one. I don't know what Magdalene actually means, if that's the name of a, I mean, Mary's her name. Uh, Magdalene, I don't think is her surname. I think it's just where she was from, perhaps. Yeah, Magdala. Okay, Mary, yeah, Mary Magdalene. So hopefully that, hopefully that answers your question, but obviously there's lots more you can learn. I mean, she's a, a, a historical figure, character in the Bible, so, you could certainly learn quite a bit more about her. And sometimes learning about someone, learning about something like this might be a way to interpret some information here. So it might be something that ha she, um, that, that Emil Ferris is showing us and um, wants us to know some things or assumes we know certain things about this painting that might unlock different clues. So and that, that's, the, uh, that's the idea. Christine looks like you just typed the letter I, so I'm not sure what that means, but hopefully that helps a little bit. I think it's something to, to continue uh, to 
to learn about and talk about. Because again, this image will show up uh, multiple times. Uh, for example, and, and like, and she also tells us here, if you read this text, um, painting, uh, it was the shadows that hung heavy above them both and made me smell the damp odor of the basement, the secrets of bones and other buried hidden things. Uh, I sense that there is something, I sense that there is something else in that painting that I need to see, something I've forgotten, a clue, as she writes in that sort of wobbly handwriting. Yeah, right, so the, there are several Marys. So there's Mary, mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, right? There's Mary, the sister of Martha. I think that's a different Mary, right? So there's, um, it's a common name, I guess. Um, yeah. So the idea is, again, that there might be a clue here. And so, like, because Karen thinks there's a clue, she will later explain what she thinks is a clue about this painting. Um, but just to kind of look through some details, like, we have... This figure here um, with jewelry, it seems. We have this figure here who appears to have angel wings on the right. There's also something weird going on in the background here. And so I don't want to spoil too much, but there might be something there. And there's a somebody has a handful of snakes for some reason. Um, so it's not clear who's who that is or what their plan is with those snakes. Um, but that's something that we might uh, need to revisit uh, later on. So keep an eye on those kind of details. So let me see, do I need to go back this way to get to the slideshow? Yeah, cool. Um, another example. So this is another example. We talked about this the other day, actually, in class, the, um, in the face, one of the face-to-face -face classes. This painting by Fuseli, this is The Nightmare. And this is a painting. This is a painting. It's not actually at the Art Institute of Chicago, as it says in the text here, that they drove to the Detroit Institute of Arts, which is where this painting actually is housed. And we can see it here. Um, this is... The original painting, it's a really unusual painting, really famous for its originality, I guess, um, but also its, uh, its surrealism, essentially. It's an unusual image of uh, sleep paralysis, which is something, I don't remember how this came up in class, actually, sleep paralysis. Um, I don't remember how that came up in class. But anyway, this is the, uh, this is it. The, uh, the painting depicts a woman reclining on a bed. There's a demon sitting on her. Um, looking back at us uh, for some reason. Some people think he looks like he's holding a cigar. Uh, and then there is a horse peeking in from the background and the horse has white eyes. Um, there's a reddish kind of cloth draped uh, across the bed below her. Um, but it is a depiction of, you might say, sleep paralysis. Um, and which is a real phenomenon that many people have experienced. I'm trying to, why did that come up? Why were we talking about sleep paralysis in this class? I don't know. It's been a long weekend. <laughs> I've been tired all weekend. Uh, but anyway, this is the painting, and it's got this spooky-looking horse. I think the horse is almost creepier than this little demon guy. I mean, he's creepy. He's sitting there. But, like, why is the horse watching? Like, what is what is the horse's role here? Uh, it's got a, The horse has its mouth open somewhat. It seems to be almost laughing. It, but, like, the idea of it, the horse as the voyeur is just so creepy. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> There's a lot going on in this painting, obviously. And so this is a painting that Emil Ferris gives us. And when she draws it, let's take a look at her, her drawing of it. Um, you can definitely see the, the, a lot of the same details stand out, obviously. I mean, she may have actually traced this, I don't know. Um, but it is sort of detail by detail. And there's uh, the woman reclining, of course, the figure sitting on her. Uh, I think the way that Emil Ferris has drawn the lines. They do give us a sharper outline around the face of the demon figure and uh, the horse head. Uh, it looks a little less sketchy or blurry than it does in the original painting. Um, this is the kind of thing that I think would be really interesting to see up close and in person to see kind of like what's going on in the background. Like, is there anything about this? Like, this is such an unusual image. You kind of want to keep looking at it until you figure it out. And so, you know, what else can we figure out or notice about it? There seems to be a light source off to the right because we can just see the shadow of the demon guy cast on the curtain back here. Um, there's maybe a painting on her table here. There's maybe some bottles. You know, what do those have in them? Like, I mean, there's, there's so many things we could, we could look at. Another example, too, is like uh, of what we can get from Emil Ferris is sometimes she'll emphasize a detail that we might not have noticed. Um, I th yeah, I think it did come up when we talked about Little Nemo, but that was a while ago. I feel like we talked about it like a week ago or two, but maybe not. So, <laughs> I don't know. Certainly, um, maybe I was thinking about it in the other class. 
maybe because we were talking about Halloween ghost story kind of things in my applied digital studies class. I don't know. I, I, one, the thing I was noticing, if you look at this woman, is she's got this necklace, and it does really stand out in this in the Emil Ferris's illustration of it. It's obviously here in the original as well, but I didn't really notice it. Or I would not have really noticed it because in terms of the contrast, it doesn't stand out as much in the original as it does in this illustration of it. So that's the kind of thing that you can pay attention to and sometimes uh, may maybe pick up on, on a different thing from the original, but it's helpful to have both because it's almost like this is a, a shorthand version or a thumbnail or a guide to the other one. And so when you see this, you can click over here and look at the, uh, the original. So sometimes that's helpful. Um, okay, so that actually is, I guess, my last slide. So I did want, I can, I have a few minutes left, so I thought I could pull up a few pages from the book, um, but I need to kind of take a minute here to open my viewer of it. Um, I do have a physical copy, obviously, but it's not with me at the moment, so I have several pages in JPEG form that I was using for these images. Whoa, okay, there it goes. <laughs> and let me see if I can pull this up into the stream. Which one do I need? This one? Okay. Mm -hmm. Nope. Okay, good. So hopefully this works. Yeah, this is the cover page, obviously, and um, I thought I'd, I could just kind of click through a few things and, and comment on them as, as they come across here. Um, there we go. So this is the cover. I already talked about that a little bit. Uh, and here you see the notebook, right? The idea that this is by um, Karen. You can kind of see her as the voice here, even in the way that these letters are, are created and, and formed. Uh, the year for the comics that I believe is, it's not always sequential, but it does give us a sense of time, obviously, for these. So it's 1967. And yeah, let's take a look at this in terms of the artwork. I, I had meant to, whenever, um, you know, I usually do the, the soundtrack uh, when the, the stream countdown is starting, I had meant to pull up uh, Wild Thing by the Trogs, but I... Um, I ran out of time because I had to reboot my computer and other things and I was a little late getting started and Discord was messing up and I didn't get it all figured out. But hopefully you know that song. It's a pretty famous song. Um, but you can see her uh, getting started here. I think as you read this, there is almost a joke. You kind of understand or, or think she's talking about something different. Uh, as she says, it would have completely sucked if Mama had come in and found me doing it. But I started moaning real loud like D's when he used to have his boy's dreams. And then we see her sitting on the end of the bed. We see her starting to transform and then rip. My bones got longer and cracked into new shapes. And like just like Larry Talbot and the Wolfman, my skin and ligaments got thick and stretched. My teeth grew out to be finger long and jagged. The nightmare gown, which Mama was so proud of finding for a steal, had ripped to shreds. It was a shame because even though I never liked the girly look of the nighty, I knew that Mama would be super disappointed because I hadn't taken good care of my things. Even though they were far away, I could sense that the mob was getting closer and closer. And even though it hurt, my, I, even though it hurt, I felt happy and I threw back my head. Oh, as I, yeah. And so this page, in my little copy of these things, some of these pages are broken up. This, I don't know why. Um, but basically she's becoming this monster here. And uh, the people are responding to that. They're going to come kill her yeah there she is and uh, I love this image like this sort of huh like she's this giant werewolf and somewhat surprised and annoyed by these people that show up uh, to kill her the angry mob and then you can see sometimes the images do get really violent as she's doing it here she's uh, eating some of the people in the mob uh, but this kind of transitions to show us that she was um, this is her imagination. Like she's she's drawing these things. We can see the notebook here. We can see Blimmy, her little uh, teddy bear, and um, then we see her uh, going to talk to her mom. See the the dream scared her. Um, not just because, not the werewolf part, but the mob part has scared her, and so that's what she's uh, reacting to here. She's well, she's killed by the silver bullet in her dream. 
Uh, so yeah, I think we're about out of time. So let me just give you all a sense of what to read to next and then we'll be able to talk about it. We'll do the same things like we've been doing where I'll give you a chunk and then I'll give you some questions or things to read through and, and in terms of detail. Please remember if you are not in person face to face on Wednesday that you're still responsible to discuss and carry on class on your own in Discord or in Canvas. I'll put up those questions. So make sure you do that so that I'm, I'm, on Wednesday I will see um, X-Men and Justice League. So everyone else, Avengers, Defenders, Teen Titans, you should plan on, is that right? Do I have the group names right? I think I do. Um, you should plan on participating online in Discord, if you know, assuming Discord's working, but uh, Canvas will be the other place. So you should do one of those three things every day of class, either show up in person or chat on Discord or uh, add thoughts on the Canvas thread. Um, and you should go back and make sure you've done that. If I've got Canvas threads for things, make sure that you participate them in them if you weren't present in class or using Discord to do that with your group. Okay, so just a reminder there. Um, otherwise, let's see, I need to kind of come up with a page to read to. Um, I think um, I think that'll be good if you read up through. It's kind of hard to tell because like with the physical page, I, physical book, I can kind of thumb through it and like tell you this is where to stop. We can kind of get a sense of how far along a segment is. Okay, how about read up to this one? So you can stop when you get to this one. It's like a giant sort of heart-shaped monster. Uh, February 1967, The Devil's Picnic. So read up to The Devil's Picnic, and uh, that should be a good chunk, I think. Um, I'll, I'll double check once I get my physical copy back from my office, but that's um, probably, you know, unless I say otherwise, uh, read up until, make sure you read up until uh, February, 9, February 67, The Devil's Picnic. Okay, so hopefully that was a good intro for this book. It's a it's a lovely book. It's a beautiful book. It is a sad book. Um, I mentioned the content warning on this a couple of times, so I'll just remind you all in terms of that. Uh, it does deal with uh, child abuse in some cases and also sexual abuse. Uh, it is, there is some violence. Most of the violence is implied rather than depicted. It's not graphic violence like we saw in Nat Turner. So it it is tragic violence, but it's not... Um, not violent. It does also depict uh, sexuality, so uh, another another theme, another motif. Uh, these are uh, adult books. I mean, books for adults, and so there there are sometimes the kinds of content that are more appropriate for adults than than children. So keep that in mind as well uh, in terms of reading this. Okay, so hopefully that helps you get started with this book. Uh, I look forward to talking about it with you in person on Wednesday, some of you, and then some more of you on Friday. And then for Teen Titans, I hope I'll have a chance to talk with you online uh, at some point this week. Okay, so if you have any questions about your presentations, let me know. Otherwise, plan on getting those together and being able to share them on Monday, next Monday, so a week from today. Okay, great. Well, I'll wrap it up here. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope you're having a good day. It's a beautiful fall day, so get outside if you can. Hopefully you had a chance to see some leaves changing this weekend. My, my yard is finally committed. Like, my yard, all of the plants, pretty much, except for that one, all, uh, has decided to start changing. And my green screen just decided to fall down some more. So that surprised me a little bit. But, you know, clearly I need to make a decision about that. Either put it back up or pull it all the way down. Okay, great. Well, uh, see you later. Take care. Bye.